Are you ready for the word? Well, you know what? It's not looking too bad out there. People keep coming in. It's looking a little bit better out there. You might have to come early next week to get a seat. Amen, amen. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. I am always open, listening, on the lookout for any kind of activity that looks like it has something to do with Bible prophecy. I do not believe that we need to, do you need something, sir? No, sir. no we're good, okay, all right. When my usher is sitting in a different place, I want to know what's going on, all right? <laughs> and that's a good thing, that's a good thing. <clears throat> but um, I don't think we should be overly obsessed with prophecy, I think some people get a little too overboard with it. But I think we need to know enough that we are aware of where we are on God's timetable. It was recently brought to my attention that in 2016, under the Bush administration, a panel committee came to the president with a prediction that the United States and Israel would be attacked within 10 years by Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. Interestingly, those countries and one more are the ones that are mentioned in Bible prophecy, particularly in Ezekiel as being the moment when the Antichrist would be revealed. Now you know and I've taught you and we've shared it in testimonies and prayers and preachings and everything else and sermons that as long as the Holy Spirit is on this planet and he is right now on this planet because he's in you and you and you and because he's in you you're full of power amen how many, how many of you are kingdom warriors? Amen, I like that, I like that. Um, the Holy Spirit being here means the Antichrist cannot be revealed. However, I do believe he's on the planet. I do believe he's a grown man. And I believe that there's a possibility we may even know him, don't know him, not knowing that he is the Antichrist. Now, having said that, if the Bush administration study committee was right. We are talking about a war that would take place in the middle of the Great Tribulation. Which means that you have to take three, three and a half years away from 2026. This was a report given in 2016 they said 10 years, that would be 2026. 20, We're coming up on 2023. 20, which means that the war that we would call the grand finale ending the Great Tribulation is only months away. Now, I say that to tell you this. I know that we don't know the day or the hour. Okay, we're, we're comfortable with that. But we do know the seasons. Jesus said, you shall know the seasons. And he said, when you see these things come to pass, lift up your head for your redemption draws nigh. And the expression, lift up your head, in the original language says, get ready. Now, my point is this. I believe, I, I, you know, it, come January of 2023, we're still here. And I have been wrong in my predictions. I'll just start all over and say, well, we're still going to have a revival. But I just really believe 
that something is about to break loose, not only for Victory Christian Center, but for the body of Christ during the fall. Going, in, going from about the middle of September, particularly October, strong in October, November, that's the way I feel, and then in December. I really, really think we need to get ready. And I have a sister here that has been telling us for months now, actually over a year, get ready. Wake up. And so how many of you are awake this morning? Amen. All of those is, uh, that got back from Florida are wide awake, right? Yes, I, I can see the enthusiasm back there. All right, now, I want you to be aware that both the Jew and the Muslim believe that the Messiah is about to be revealed. Now, the Jews believe that the Messiah has not yet come that he is about to come. And in preparation, they have already finished training a priesthood to carry on Judaism worship according to the Old Testament. They have also finished training the priesthood for animal sacrifice, which the Antichrist will allow them to do during the first three and a half years of the great, quote, great tribulation. They have also finished construction of a prefab temple. They can have it up in 90 days. What's so interesting about that is almost a replay of Solomon's temple when David came to Solomon, when David came to God and said, God, I am in this nice palace. I'm standing here on the balcony looking out over to where the tabernacle is, a 500-year-old tent, though it's never had to have any repairs. God, it's just not right. I want to build you a nice house. And God said, that's a good idea, but I can't let you do it because you're a man of war, you have blood on your hands, but I will let your son Solomon do it. David was so enthusiastic that what he did, he had the temple prefabbed. He had all the marble, all the gold, all the columns, all the wood, everything that was necessary to build the temple and make it a, a building about the size of what we're standing in here today. And that building today would be the most expensive building on the planet because everything in it not only was expensive, but it was all overlaid with two inches of 24 karat gold, polished like a mirror, so that the one single candelabra in the room that had no windows was so bright it was blinding when you walked in there. And you and I are that temple today, not made by man's hand, but made by the Almighty's hand. And Jesus said, I am the light, and that light is in us. Then Jesus said, you are the light. So what's happening is this. The old carnal man is being overlaid with deity, and the Holy Spirit is polishing us up on the inside, and we're getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And after a while, there's no darkness within us. There's no depression within us. We're not upset. We're not having anxiety attacks. We are walking in victory. We know how to praise the Lord. We know how to celebrate. We are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the power of the Word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus. The Bible says that when Solomon's temple went up, there was not the sound of a hammer or a saw, because the building was prefabbed. Everything just went together like a puzzle. And today we have a, a repeat of that ready to go into action. There's no problem putting up the temple today where the temple used to be. The Dome of the Rock, the Muslim's place of worship, is over a cave. That cave was not where Solomon's temple stood, but where the altar of sacrifice stood. Right next to it, there was a drain, like a drain pipe, and the blood of the animals in the sacrifice was drained into that cave, and they had the washing of the water, and you can still go to Israel today, to that very spot, go down in the cave from outside the city and see that there's still water there. And the Bible teaches us that there was no smell of blood in there because the place was kept flush clean all the time. And so you have the Dome of the Rock, but the Solomon Temple was right at the front of the Eastern Gate. And so if I'm standing looking east at the Dome of the Rock, the Eastern Gate is over here to my left. And there's absolutely plenty of room to put the temple there. And so what's going to happen is this. There's going to be one world religion when the Antichrist comes on the scene. 
And that one world religion is going to be a unity of those who've messed up. But it will come under the name of Judaism, Christianity, and uh, Islam. All three of those religions stem from Father Abraham. All other religions, Buddhism, Confucius, whatever you want to call all those other religions, are not really religion, they're philosophy. If you go back and study your history on the religions of the world, you'll discover very quickly that it is the philosophy that they tried to make a religion out of. And you can trace it down and see for yourself that it is the philosophy. And so my point in telling you all of this is that right now, the Muslims are trying to convert everybody to Islam. Anybody that, is not, that does not convert to Islam is an infidel. And according to their book, infidels are to be killed. And so they're slaughtering people that reject Islam. The Jews are actually, the Orthodox Jews are actually building their own group. They're what we, what we would call soul winning, okay? And so I want to tell you this. If that's what's going on with those two religions, where is Christianity right now? Christianity right now is losing membership. But there is a rumbling taking place in the spirit world. And all of a sudden, here and there and other places, you're seeing fires pop up. Something's happening here. Something's happening here. Something's happening here. And right now, there is an awakening in the body of Christ. Church, get ready. We are about to see a Holy Ghost move of God on planet Earth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Change, change, change is coming. Get ready for it. I believe the change not only is going to affect the church, I believe it affect our nation. I do not believe that God's going to let the United States of America go down the tube. I believe that this nation exists for one reason. However it came into existence is irrelevant at the point I'm making. There had to be a Christian witness on this planet. And at the time of the birth of this nation, we were coming out of what we call the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. The church as it existed at that time was nothing more than a political party. And all of a sudden, people began to say, we want the freedom to worship God. We called it a new world, but it was a new beginning. And suddenly change began to take place. And God raised up the strongest, richest, mightiest nation that has ever existed in history. The United States of America, which still is the strongest and the greatest and the most powerful nation on this planet. But we are here because of one reason, and that one reason is that we sent missionaries around the world. And I want you to understand that God has an investment in America because that has been his voice to planet Earth. And God is not going to let America go down the drain. I don't know how he's going to change it. I don't know when he's going to change it. I know it won't be political. I know it won't be financial. It's going to be spiritual. But when that spiritual takes place, the finances to get in line, the politicians to get in line, and somebody might get saved in Washington, who knows? The Holy Ghost could fall on Congress, and some of those people you've been, are going to get saved. It can happen. Come on, people. Come on. All right. Change. Here's, here's my point of urgency, and I'll go to the scripture here in a minute. My point of urgency is this. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And when Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens opened, God the Father spoke, saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus. And as Jesus walked away, to paraphrase it, John turned to his disciples and said, as of today, things have changed. There goes the Messiah. And some of his disciples followed Jesus. Jesus spent three and a half years 
training his disciples for change. I'm believing that from COVID beginning until now and until the end of this year, which is going to be about three and a half years, I'm believing that oof, I am believing that God had been preparing a people. There are those who sit on their couches and watch it on YouTube. Praise God for technology. But God is calling people out of the woodwork. God is calling people out of the past. God is calling people out of every age group. Kingdom warriors are coming on the throne. And they're going to enter into the presence of God and walk out of the presence of God with power and authority and begin to do the thing that Jesus called us to do from the very beginning. Hallelujah. Believe it with all of my heart. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Jesus spent three and a half years training his disciples, preparing his disciples for change. The change came in three events. One, his death on the cross. Two, his resurrection. And three, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand that the day that Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished. And the ground began to shake. And your Bible says that every rock on the planet cracked. All of nature changed that day in a moment. And I believe that in a moment there is going to be a change take place again. And an awakening that Jesus Christ died on the cross that you and I might have life and have it abundantly. Not just insurance to go to heaven, but to have an abundant existence. Not just getting by, but being blessed to the point that we can be a blessing to other people around us. That second event that changed the world brought on another earthquake. And on the third day, the angel rolled away the stone to let people see that Jesus was not in there. The stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. He did, he did not need any help getting out. He was already out when they opened the tomb. But I want you to understand that people's lives were changed forever that time because they saw an empty tomb. Oh, they're about to see Jesus. Hallelujah. And in that appearance when Jesus said, Here I am. I'm for real. Touch me. Feel me. Put your hand where the nails went in my hand. I am for real. I want you to know something. I stand here to tell you today, Jesus is real. I know Jesus is real because of what he has done in this old fellow right here. I know Jesus is real because of what I see him doing in people around me. Jesus is real. Hallelujah. The third event came on the 50th day. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the world has not been the same since. Church, you and I, yes, need to wake up. It's time for change. If you have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you have everything that Jesus had when he walked on this planet. You lack for nothing. And Jesus said, the things that I do, you do also. You have the ability right now to do anything that Jesus did on this planet. Heal the sick. Bind up the brokenhearted, set the captive free. Raise the dead, chase out devils. Some of us have had to witness our own believers, those that believe like us, pull back into their shell because they don't want to be a spectacle. They don't want to be put on the spot. They don't want to be thought of as weird. But I want to tell you something, there's a hurting world out there. People on drugs and alcohol. Divorce is 70% rate right now. 
Children are rebelling against parents and parents are ignoring their children. Politics is a mess. Government is a mess. The whole world is crying out for deliverance. Jesus is not coming back again to save the world. He sent us, kingdom warriors, he sent us to bring a difference to this planet. And folk, God is about to give us the latter rain. And in that latter rain, the former rain was seed time and the latter rain is harvest time. Seed time, when that first rain came on the day of Pentecost, there was 120 ears of corn that exploded into 8,000 ears of corn. You understand what I'm doing there? But I want you to understand that, that we have been watering, we've been planting, we've been testifying, we've been witnessing, we've been preaching, and all of a sudden we're about to get the, uh, the binders out and we're going to go harvest. I want you to know the harvest is coming in and there's a harvest to be had, and you and I are going to see the greatest hour of the church that has ever been experienced in 2,000 years. And with that, I'm through with my introduction. <laughs> Isaiah. Chapter 45, a powerful, powerful scripture. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11. Change is coming. Are you ready? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and Israel's maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my people. If you have a different Bible translation, it may say sons or it may say uh, children. The one who made everything is saying now, ask me about the things coming that concerns you and me. I'm here to tell you this morning Jesus is coming. I'm here to tell you this morning, God's calling you out of your comfort zone. You are about to be called out of your comfort zone whether you like it or not. Lord, just leave me alone. Let me sit here and do my thing. No, no, no. You're about to do God's thing. That was a weak amen, but I'll accept what I have. Uh, what I can, thank you. All right. Now watch this again. Ask me of things to come concerning my people and concerning the work of my hands... You command me. I can take that in the original language and read it like this. And concerning the works of my hands, proclaim it. Concerning the works of my hand, demonstrate it. And so I have two things here that are out of that one verse of uh, scripture I want you to get a hold of. If you get a hold of nothing else I've said today, get a hold of this. God said, ask me what's coming. And take command of my word and make it happen. That is the message of the hour. What's coming for me? What's coming for you? God has a path and a purpose for every one of us. All of it is a part of the puzzle, if I can say it that way, or a part of the weave on the, uh, the loom, if I can put it that way. But everything that you are called to do and everything that you are called to do, when it all comes together, it's going to make perfect sense. You may say at the moment, I don't understand why I'm going through this. I don't understand what's happening here. I don't understand why God won't thus and so. Listen, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your doings, all of your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct the path and it will come out on the other side victorious. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. Very familiar passage of scripture, and I'm not going to be preaching the text of this story. I just want to point out some things. The hand of the Lord came upon me, Ezekiel says, and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. The hand of the Lord is upon me. People without I'll just go ahead and say without exception in this room, God's hand is on you. Thank you Lord. 
And God is bringing you out of the natural and carnal into his spirit. And I suggest strongly that you're going to begin to hear the voice of God like you've never heard it before. It may wake you up in the middle of the night. It may check you over the stove when the peas are boiling. He may catch you at the traffic light. But the, oof, God is about to talk to you. Amen. Amen. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around. Behold, there, was a, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can Victory Christian Center live again? Can Azel, Texas live again? Can this tri-county area live again? Can our nation live again? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, prophesy, preach, proclaim, declare to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath, I will cause a quickening, I will cause my Holy Spirit, I will cause fire. All these words that I'm using can be translated out of that word breath in the Hebrew to enter into you and you shall live. Three things I call your attention to. He brought me, he calls me, and he sat me down. He brought me, he calls me, and he sat me down. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out into the Spirit. Wherever you are right now, God is about to bring you out of that situation and put you into His Spirit, into His presence, like you've never experienced the presence of God before. It's a new day. It's a new beginning, folk. It's not about the Baptists or the Methodists or the Catholics or the Pentecostals or the Charismatics. We're talking about the body of Christ. Born again believers. God didn't create denominations. He didn't sanctify denominations. He said we are his children. Amen. Not only is he, is he bringing us out into the spirit realm, but he causes us to pass around, and folk, what he's, what he's doing is opening our eyes, and, I, and I, want us, I want you to get this. Right now, what you are hearing more than anything else is what's wrong. What's wrong with our government? What's wrong with the economy? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? I'm here to tell you something. The enemy wants you looking at the problem, not looking at God. God wants you looking at him and not looking at the problem. And he's going to cause you to pass around and give you a bird eyes view of what's really going on and it's not about inflation it's not about drugs and alcohol it's about people needing the lord jesus christ it's about somebody getting in the pulpit whether the pulpit's like this pulpit or out there on the job you've got a pulpit somewhere and you need to get in your pulpit and begin to preach jesus you need to be hallelujah i'm telling you he brought me he called me and he sat me down Right where I needed it to be. Amen. I stand before you repeating what God spoke to my heart when my wife and I came to Azel, Texas, right after the landing of Noah's Ark. <laughs> and I said, God, why Azel? Oh, I was very upset leaving Pensacola Beach. All that beautiful sand and water coming to Azel, Texas. Amen. 
God said, I want you there when I make my move. Well, he better hurry up and move. Huh? <laughs> you got that right. But the thing is, I believe that move is about to take place. And God is going to place us right where we're supposed to be. He'll bring us into the spirit. He'll cause us to get a proper vision of what we're supposed to be looking at, not what the world telling us to look at. And he will be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. And all of this will fall together and we will all shout the victory and celebrate. You're going to see your loved ones saved. You're going to see those people you don't like get saved. You're going to see a victory taking place. I want you to know something. That some of you are financially struggling. God's going to bless you financially to the point that you can be a blessing to those that don't know Jesus. And let them see that God is my source. Get ready for a celebration that's coming. Hallelujah. And now I read Luke chapter 9. I hadn't given you the first point of my message yet. Yes, I have, really. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings. What saying? If you go back, you'll look and find Jesus said... There are those standing here that will not taste death until they see the glory of God. Amen. Now, if you and I had been interpreting that, we'd have thought well, that, the, that the end's about to take place, the rapture's about to take place, and we're all going to heaven. But it was eight days later. Anytime you see eight days, eight in the Bible means a new beginning, change was taking place on the eighth day. And it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. As Jesus prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. His robe became white and glistering. Behold, two men talked with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of Jesus' demise or, de or decrease or departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. When they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. I will come back to that passage of scripture shortly. But I submit to you that the reason this incident is in the Bible is that Jesus wants to emphasize that change is coming when we wake up. I know, sister, you've been telling us for over a year, wake up. God is about to do something. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Now concerning the times and the season, brethren, believers, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And when they say peace and safety, by the way, peace and safety is the motto for the nation of Israel today. They shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. But you, brethren, everybody say, that's me. Everybody say, that's me. Thank you. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day of judgment should overtake you as a thief. You're all children of the light, children of the day. We're not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be self-controlled, sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, 
kingdom warriors, the hope of salvation. For God had not appointed us to wrath or the great tribulation. Church, you're not going through the tribulation. We are not mid-trib. We are not post-trib. We are pre-trib. We're going to get out of here before all of that happens. Thank you, Jesus. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, sozo salvation, delivering of the whole man, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, that means dead in the grave, we should live together with him. Therefore, everybody say therefore. Therefore, therefore comfort one another and edify one another, just as you are also doing. And that's what I've been doing for the last 45 minutes, trying to edify you a little bit. Jesus is coming. I am so excited. Company's coming. But he's coming as a thief. You see, that's not the second coming. The first coming, he came as a baby. He came as the Son of Man. The second coming, he's He's not coming as a thief. He's coming on a white horse. And all the world is going to see him. And you and I, brothers and sisters, are going to be riding right behind him. That's the second coming. But when he comes as a thief, is when the Holy Spirit is called back home. Jesus said he'll never leave you or forsake you. He says, Holy Spirit is leaving. Guess what? He's Pulling all the saints with him. And we'll meet the Lord in the air. And that mother-in-law will wake up the next morning. And that son-in-law that she was giving a hard time has gone to heaven. I just wanted to lighten the load a little bit. Point number one. You ready? <laughs> Are you ready? God has designed change for this season. Now make it brief. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And immediately his word, he spoke. And his spirit, the Holy Ghost went to work. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing was made without the Word. Jesus is the Word. And so in the beginning, when God said, let there be light, Jesus said, I'm the light. Here comes Jesus. I'm the light. So God the Father spoke the light, spoke the word, spoke Jesus, and his spirit, his Holy Spirit, began to work with him in the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of a sudden are making everything that happened. And get this. Talk about signs and wonders. As a galaxy exploded over there, as an inhabitant of planet appeared over here as water began to flow through rivers as trees sprouted up from the ground those are signs and wonders and my Bible tells me that you and I in these last days are going to be doing signs and wonders Amen. a blind man come to Jesus Jesus, along with the Godhead who made man in his own image and then knelt down and took red clay, Adam means red clay, and made an earth form and stuck him, his reproduced self in that clay form. And that carbon unit stood up with eyes that could see, ears that could hear, a nose that could smell, hand that could feel, feet that could walk. 
That same Jesus knelt down one day and spit in the dirt that he made for that earth suit. Made some mud. Put it on that blind man's eyes. I think he made mud balls, stuck them in there for eyeballs. Said, now go wash your face. Church, we need to wash our face and come back seeing. It's time we wash our face and come back seeing. Second point. I'm getting through my points fast, huh? I asked if you were ready for change. We need to ready ourselves for change. And I give you three illustrations of what I'm talking about. Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, and John. Moses was given instructions to build a tabernacle. And Moses built that tabernacle exactly the way God instructed. And the scripture says that when Moses finished the tabernacle, God moved in. And the glory of God was there. And the glory of God was so strong that Moses could not go in there. By day, that glory would lift out of the tabernacle so they could go in and worship. And by day, it would be a cloud to protect them from the hot sun. And by night, it would be a ball of fire to protect them from the night cold. But whenever that glory went into that tent, no man could go in. I want you to know that Jim Horton didn't fix this tabernacle. His name is Jesus. Jesus fixed this tabernacle. And when Jesus finished with this tabernacle, the glory of God came in. And the Moses of the world can't get in anymore. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Isaiah, a prophet, man of God, got off track. He didn't realize it, but till one day he was dependent on the king for everything instead of depending on God. And God took Uzziah out of his life. And something happened. Isaiah says, when the world died, I saw the Lord. High and lifted up. And his glory filled the temple. Folk, it's time for us not to depend on the world system, but to depend on God Almighty. Peter, James, and John. Jesus had said, there's those standing here that won't see death before they see the glory of God. Eighth day, the new day of new beginnings. Jesus got a hold of Peter, James, and John and took them up into the mountain to pray. And they went to sleep. Peter, James, and John represent the church in everything. Peter, the preacher. James, the first martyr. John, the writer of Revelation. were asleep. But when they woke up, they saw Jesus in all of his glory. Amen. Church, it's time to wake up and see the glory of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My third and final point, God's presence in praise and worship will manifest change. The reason I'm bringing in the team next Sunday night for a praise and worship rally is because they're genuine. They're not much to look at. They're rough. Some of them are delivered from drugs and alcohol. Some of them have been living out on the streets. They have powerful, powerful testimony. They'll be sharing that. 
But as I sat out there under the sun, sweating, I watched the drummer. As he played those drums with all of his heart, sweat pouring off of him. I thought, how is he doing that? Because he loved God. He was totally in the spirit. Next Sunday night, I want us to know what it is to experience the glory of God Amen. in praise and worship. In fact, I'd like to see it tonight, wouldn't you? Amen. Amen. I can handle that. Yeah. I tell you what, it's been a long time since praise and worship kept me from preaching a sermon. I think it would be a good time to do that tonight. Thank you, Barbara. I appreciate you. Let praise and worship take over and I don't have to preach. Is that okay? All right. <laughs> praise and worship will manifest change. And here's how it works. In praise and worship, the whole purpose of praise and worship, and I understand praise and worship is more than just singing songs, okay? I understand that. But... That's what we focus on. Praise and worship, true praise and worship brings a spirit of unity. I've talked to two pastors in the last couple of three weeks that are struggling with their congregation because of issues that have come up that's causing division. Trick of the devil, trick of the enemy. They know that. And what they're doing is asking people to pray. But I learned from the Brownville Church in Pensacola, if you want a victory, start praising God. I have prayed and I have asked, I have prayed and I have asked, now it's time to celebrate. Victory comes on praise. Hallelujah! It brings a spirit of unity. That spirit of unity is not just between brothers and sisters, but also between us and God. And we call it communion. It's more than just a little cup and a wafer. It's a common union, a communion with God. And as we enter into that communion with God, we find a fellowship with God. Whenever I say that, I think of oh, what a friend we have in Jesus, you know. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Unity, communion, fellowship. And as I fellowship with God, it moves into a companionship. And when I say this, I don't mean in carnal expressions, but the companionship is a oneness, like between a husband and a wife. We become one. Jesus said, Father, I pray that you make them one with us, as we are one. And as we enter into that companionship, then it becomes very obvious what Jesus was saying, because it becomes a partnership. Jesus said the things that I do. You do also. Stand with me, please, all over the room, if you will. Let's just lift our hands and our heart to the Lord for a moment. Let's just worship the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Lord, I want to be near you. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to be in your intimate mercy. Lord, I want to be like you. No one can be.
Lord.